to their success. They go out in mission. They're sent out to, to minister to uh, others the gospel. And, and there must have been some amazing success. That's why they were joyful. But, but nothing's mentioned. N nothing is told to us of the results of their being sent out on mission. In fact, interestingly enough, we don't learn anything about how many repented or how many people were healed. It's just not said at all. In fact, Matthew doesn't even mention it. He's very clear to focus on the people being sent out by Jesus, but not, not doesn't say a word about, about what happened as a result of that. And what Luke tells us is that the disciples, the disciples were actually thrilled because of the power that they had. That, that Jesus had given them, th this power that, that even the demons had to submit to their authority. That was incredible. But why doesn't Matthew mention the results? Why doesn't he tell us? Well, quite simply, that's not what he's concerned about. As, as someone has said up until this point in his gospel, Matthew has given reports as to how people responded to Jesus. But here in chapter 11, for the very first time, Matthew gives us Jesus' assessment of men's response to the gospel. And what this person says is interesting. It's not a good report. Jesus was very popular. Extremely popular with the crowds. His disciples were elated as they were able to use his authority. But in spite of Jesus' popularity and in spite of the disciples' use of his power we see very little repentance evident. In fact, Matthew makes clear, makes this clear when he tells us about the pronouncement of, of woe upon the unrepentant cities who heard uh, the preaching and teaching of Jesus but did not respond. And I'd like us to begin by looking in Matthew chapter 11 at verses 20 through 24. And we will see these very words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 11 verses 20 through 24. Speaking of Jesus, then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. We use the word woe as an expression of regret or distress. Woe is me. But that is not how the Bible uses the word woe or how it's used in the Bible. In fact, to pronounce woe in the New Testament is a, is a form of judgment, of impending doom, of condemnation. You see, what Jesus is speaking about here is the wrath of God being poured out upon the people of these towns because they have rejected him. You say, well, I don't quite follow this. And that's good if you don't quite follow this because you need this context in order to follow it better. So I'd like us to better understand this, and I'd like us, in order to do that, to look back, starting at the second verse, and reading through verse 19. 
So follow along with me from Matthew 11, starting at verse 2. Now when G John had heard in prison about the deeds of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. And the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in kings' houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messengers before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah, who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. But to what shall I compare this corrupt generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to their playmates. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking and they say, he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking and they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. We've reached a turning point in Jesus' ministry. There aren't any neon signs that tell us this. But as we understand the Gospel of Matthew and as it, Matthew presents to us the ministry of Jesus, it is very obvious that the 11th chapter has marked a turning point. You see, when Jesus came on the scene and for the first year of his ministry, he was extremely well received by people. That year is called the year of popularity. Then in Matthew 11 and into chapter 12, we see a big change where Matthew begins to show his readers that Jesus' popularity has changed. And now it's changed to opposition by the leaders and by those under their influence. Jesus moves from revealing his authority to the nation to refuting attacks that are made against him. And Matthew begins tracking that opposition here in these verses that I was just sharing with you. Where, as he focuses on John the baptizer and John's imprisonment, and then John's own questions about Jesus' identity and about Jesus' ministry, which, by the way, were not asked because John doubted Jesus, no, after all, it, John declared that Jesus was the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. No, it wasn't that he was doubting Jesus. It was for clarification purposes that John sent disciples to verify who Jesus truly is for clarification purposes. And what Jesus did was to use this opportunity to affirm John. And to affirm John's ministry to his own disciples and to those around them. And to confirm his own messianic role. You see, what Matthew tells us is that Jesus' message was virtually identical to that of John. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is, is at hand. 
John the Baptist said, for the kingdom of heaven is near. The miracle working power of Jesus is what attests to this message. And that's what people were responding to and flocking to Jesus. But we're also told by Matthew that the message of the kingdom was being proclaimed and that it, was, that it actually um, was suffering violence. And in verse 12, we see that, that uh, Jesus says, the violent take it by force. And there have been all sorts of, of interpretations and misinterpretations about what that means. But I believe from this, we see that the message of the kingdom was forcefully advancing. That is, it was moving forward extremely powerfully. God was working in the transformation of people's hearts and minds, of their lives being literally changed by the power of the gospel. Multitudes of people. And that's why John heard about it in prison. He heard about those whose eyes were blind but were now being opened. Those who were dead who were being raised to life. Those weren't just merely physical healings, but spiritual, powerful, life-transforming uh, changes that were taking place as those who were spiritually dead were becoming alive to the things of God. Those who were spiritually blind were being awakened to see. And so we recognize that John hears about this in prison. And from the time of his imprisonment, the message of the kingdom has been making great inroads. And this is what John the baptizer came to do, to prepare the way of Jesus who was coming after him. But at the same time as the gospel was making great inroads and the kingdom of God was expanding, wicked, wicked people were trying that much harder to plunder the message of the gospel and to destroy its, uh, its purpose. Which is why Jesus said, the violent take it by force. Someone has said the point would be that the kingdom has been advancing, but it has not swept aside all opposition as John had expected. As the kingdom advances, the attacks on it by violent men increase. And so it was that the popularity that Jesus enjoyed was now changing. And there was, there was um, opportunity for people to confront Jesus and to question Jesus and to doubt Jesus. And to call into question why Jesus was doing the things that Jesus had done. And here's where we see that, that Matthew says... And it's so very clear to us concerning this revelation about the message of the gospel. It's easy to follow Jesus for the wrong reasons. It's so easy to follow him for the wrong reasons. Follow Jesus and your life will be easy. Follow Jesus and you'll have great success in what you're doing. Follow Jesus and you'll never know any problems. Follow Jesus and every desire of your heart, he will provide. Follow Jesus, dot, dot, dot. You fill in the blanks. Maybe you've heard it. Right now, there are people who are preaching it. People who are blindly believing it. This is a reality. Many people following Jesus for all the wrong reasons. And it's easy to do so. People do it today. People did it, did it in Jesus' day. Jesus likened that generation, interestingly enough, in verse 16, to children. Do you see that there? Children who complain because he would not dance to their tune. Ever get mad at God for not doing what you wanted God to do? As if somehow God is at your beckoning call He's only there when you need him, when you want him. And you get frustrated when you pray and he doesn't do what you prayed for, what you asked for. If that's your conception of God, it's wrong. If that's your understanding of, of why God exists, it's unfounded. 
Jesus likened that generation to children because it was very easy to do. As someone has said, they wanted to have it your way, Messiah. And when Jesus refused to conform to their desires and their expectations, they wanted nothing to do with him. And this person added, they were fickle folks. Indeed, they were. It's rather interesting that Jesus mentions, or Ma actually Matthew mentions, and Jesus talks about John the Baptist. We sometimes lump people together. They're all in the same pot, so to speak. They're all alike. Listen, Jesus and John the Baptist were incredibly different. I mean, you probably couldn't get two more different people than Jesus and John the Baptist. They're cousins. They're related. But they're very different from one another. And guess what? That generation rejected both of them. When, when John came to them fasting, that is neither eating or drinking, that's what verse 18 tells us, they called him demon-possessed. When Jesus comes on the scene along with his disciples, and they come eating and drinking, which is what verse 19 says, they called Jesus a glutton and a drunkard. And one who dares to associate with sinners. There was no pleasing them. That's why Jesus rebuked the cities in Israel. That's why he spoke as he did. They heard the life-changing message of the gospel and still they refused to repent. You see, John's preaching and Jesus' preaching and teaching was to bring the, the nation of Israel to repentance. It was not to draw large crowds. It was not to attract a huge following. It was to call sinners to repentance. And that's the purpose of the gospel. That's what God desires. It's not changed. The purpose of the preaching of the gospel is this, exactly the same today as it was 2,000 years ago to call people to repentance. Jesus was well thought of. He was sought after, at least for a time, by many. He was followed by awestruck crowds. He was a worker of incredible miracles. He sent out his disciples with the same message and the same authority and they perform many wonders. And many people, many people followed Jesus for the wrong reasons. How is it that you are following Jesus? Are you following him because he's called you to die to self and live for him? Are you following him because he's called you to give up everything? in order to walk after him? Are you following after Jesus because, because he is the first place in your life, the first one in your life above all others? Or are you following him because, well, that's what you've always done and that's what you keep doing? Matthew shows us the prayer of Jesus. It's a powerful prayer. It's a prayer that tells us that the Father chose to do something. I'd like to read verses 25 through 27 and have you follow along with me of Matthew chapter 11, verses 25 through 27. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come, uh, we'll stop right there. Sorry, get ahead of myself. 25 through 27. Jesus is praying. He's saying that the Father chose to conceal the things of the kingdom of heaven from those who we think are most likely to grasp them. That is, from the wise and the intelligent, and rather, instead, Jesus has chosen, the Father has chosen to reveal these things to little children. That is, to those we would consider least likely or perhaps least able to understand them. Belief is 
and acceptance, excuse me, belief and unbelief, acceptance and rejection. These are the result of the Father's choice. God is sovereign. And he's sovereign in salvation. And Jesus praises the Father because those the Father intended to understand and believe have understood and believed. And God's plan has worked out just as he purposed. And that's why Jesus gives a simple but a concise invitation, the heart of the gospel found in these next few verses that I want us to look at, verses 28 through 30. So let me continue. I started to do that. Let me come back to it. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Just take a moment and look at that for just a moment. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Verse 30, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come to me. All who labor, all who are weary, come to me. Some of you are weary right now, aren't you? Because you lost an hour of sleep last night. Yep, some of you are even nodding off. I can see that. Wake up. You don't want to miss what's coming. Wake up. I mean that. Wake up. This is the serious part. The person next to you is sleeping. You give them a good elbow. I've heard that people do that on a regular basis in this room. <laughs> Come to me, all you who labor, are weary and heavy laden, that is burdened. Are you burdened? Come to me, Jesus says. Come to me. Come to me. You know what that means? It means come now. Don't wait. Don't delay. Don't think you don't need me. Come to me and come now. Weary evokes the image of persons exhausted from their work or from their journey. While burden indicates persons weighted down with heavy loads. But listen, this is so much more than, than being weighted down, being weary with the frustrations of life or the burdens of living. Jesus explained this in Matthew 9 verse 36 where he had compassion on the crowds because they are harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus knows what your burdens are. Jesus knows the load that you're trying to carry and you're crumbling under. It's not merely the frustrations of life. That's at the surface level. He's talking about the burdens that go so deep, only he understands them full well. And you can hide them, you can mask them, you can cover them over, and for everybody else's sake, pretend they're not there. But Jesus knows the issues of your heart. The weariness and these burdens are the result of sin. It's a condition that we can neither change nor prevent. The salvation that Jesus offers is not a form of escape. It is not a promise of a bed of roses in life. It is not for a better life now. Although some preach that with great popularity. You come to Jesus because you know he is the only one who can help you in your condition. He's the only one who understands. He's the only one who paid the perfect price to change it. John Piper says, our weariness results from the cumulative multi-layered intersections of life's complexities, bodily frailties, emotional heartbreaks, and the consequences of sin. It surpasses understanding. And yes, it, yes, it does. That's why Jesus says, come, come now. Come to me. Come to him as the source of your rest, the source of your salvation. Don't walk away. Don't wait. Come. And then he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. 
for I am gentle. I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. When Jesus invites someone to be yoked with him, I want to show you something. This is what people have in mind. Isn't it cute? This is so cute. Yeah, I'll be yoked to Jesus. Of course, this is an easy yoke. It has to be what he meant. I mean, my goodness gracious, I can put my hand through here. Yeah, and my hand's here and Jesus' hand's here. We're yoked together. We're just going through life. Isn't this wonderful? You see, this is what we have in mind. This is the yoke we think Jesus has given to us. The people I know that are yoked to Jesus are people who willingly go down the path that the Father has prepared for them. They're, they're people who recognize that Jesus is with him, them, that Jesus in, in Jesus they found rest for their souls. Not because the way is easy. Not at all. But because the yoke of Jesus is easy. And because the burden of Jesus is light. Listen, they're people. They're people like Earl who along with his wife retire to a wonderful place. And his wife comes down with a dreadful disease and dies only after a year's time. And rather than kind of burying his head in the sand, Earl can starts and, and continues and has continued even up till recent days and weeks visiting others in the nursing home. And sharing the love of Jesus with people that he meets to cheer them up. Earl is 91 years old. It's people like Patricia, who as a 40-year-old young unmarried woman, moves back home to care for her father, help care for her father whose health is declining and to be there with her mother when her father passes away. Gives up what she's got going on in life because she knows that God has called her to do something and she has done it. It's people like Anne who lives with her sister. Anne is 91 and her sister's 90. And her sister has a severe case of dementia or Alzheimer's, whatever it may be, and the only thing that she really ever says is, okay, okay. Doesn't talk anymore. And Ellie was a bright, bright woman who was a secretary to some of the greatest pastors and preachers in history. And now she's reduced to her own world. And at 91 years of age, Anne cares for Ellie. Why is it that people can do that? I'll tell you why. It's not because of this. No, 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 no. Not because of this. Let me show you what it is. Let me show you what it looks like to be yoked to Jesus. Let me show you what the yoke of Jesus is really all about. This is what we think it is. Can you see the difference? That's what it means to be yoked to Jesus. Not just with an arm. <laughs> oh, I'm walking with Jesus hand in hand. No, no, no. Thank you, Tim. No. It is to put our whole person into this thing. Can you see it? Can you see yourself in here in one side? I'm not going to do it. I'll crumble under the weight. This thing is heavy. But it's to say, I'm putting myself in this thing because Jesus has called me and he's with me in it. I'm yoked with him. Do you see? And people say, oh, I don't want to be in such bondage. I'll tell you, that is not bondage. That is freedom. 
That is freedom. Because in this yoke, I'm with Jesus. And his, his yoke is easy. And his, his burden is light. Mine is heavy. Yours is heavy. You're already in, in bondage. You're already yoked to something you don't even realize what it is. It's sin. And it's crushing you. It's destroying you. It's ruining you. And you're just going on your merry way. Isn't this wonderful? I tell you what, you are in such bondage, you are blind to it, and you cannot escape it. But when you come to Jesus and are yoked with him, he sets the captives free. He has paid the price for your sin so that you do not have to walk in sin when you walk with him. You do not have to be under the weight and the guilt of the burdens and the pressures and the cares of life. We exchange the yoke of sin for the yoke of salvation. Not this, isn't that cute? But this, because it's the only way to be yoked with Jesus. And being yoked to Jesus means that you find Jesus to be your contentment. You find Jesus to be your peace, to be your satisfaction. For this is what Jesus is for us and oh so much more. And that is why he invites people to come to come, to come, and to find that for yourself. Because to be bound to Jesus Christ is to find complete rest, complete rest from the burdens of life and the full weight of sin. Let's pray.